like to uh, introduce our first speaker uh, for today, which is uh, a long-standing friend and colleague, uh, Professor Nick Tilley. Uh, Nick Tilley is a member of the uh, Giordano Institute of Security and Crime Science at uh, University College London. He is also Emeritus Professor of Sociology at Nottingham Trent University. He is author of over 150 publications, most of which relate to policing, crime prevention, or program evaluation methodology. He spent 10 years from 1992 to 2003, seconded to the Home Office, most of the time attached to the Police Research Group. He was also a senior advisor to the Home Office East Midlands research team and director from 2003 to 2007. Recent and current research projects include explanations for the international crime drop, a review of what works in crime prevention, dowry deaths by burning in Mumbai and Delhi, models for problem solving in policing and crime reduction, crime and disorder associated with suffering in England and Wales, and forms of police university collaboration to improve policing and crime reduction. He was awarded the Order of the British Empire for services to policing and crime reduction in the Queen's Birthday Honours in 2005 and elected to the Academy of the Social Sciences in 2009. Uh, this morning, Professor Tilly will be presenting on policing, problem solving and crime prevention. Can you please welcome Nick Tilly? Okay, thanks for for those uh, for those ki kind words, um, uh, and thank you for inviting me to this to this conference. Um, I'm on sabbatical at the moment, spending three months at Griffith University. Uh, I've got a lot to learn about uh, Australian policing. So far, I've spent a little time with the Queens, with a few Queensland police officers uh, in Cairns and Arakoon, and it's been a relief to find that they're recognisably sim recognisably similar to police officers in the UK. Uh, since I've been here, I've come to realise that quite a lot of police officers are from the UK, now working in Australia. Indeed, I've already met two of them actually within Arakoon and Cairns, one uh, beat officer in, in Cairns and, and another patrol officer in, uh, in Arakoon. So uh, I don't know quite how that's come about. But uh, anyway, the police in, uh, in the UK and Australia are, are recognisably similar, and they clearly do a rather difficult job. Uh, as uh, police officers in the UK, Australian officers deal with diverse problems, some of which seem to be intractable. They work in diverse contexts, inner city, outer city, remote communities, uh, indigenous communities, and they have to adjust their policing to rather uh, uh, contrasting local conditions. Um, police officers exert uh, a lot of discretion, um, in spite of being part of a disciplined organisation. There's always that kind of contradiction between being part of a disciplined organisation but at the same time uh, inevitably e e exercising, exercising uh, discretion, sometimes leading to uh, imaginative work, uh, sometimes leading to, well, less imaginative work and at worst corrupt behaviour. But that tension, I think, is always there. The police officers here, as in the UK, work quite a lot with third party organisations in attempting to control crime, although they find that uh, often to be frustrating. Um, they're also highly intelligent, imaginative, uh, for the most part, and committed to trying to reduce crime disorder and fear of crime that dog many communities. At least that's been my consistent experience. I suppose having met no more than roughly 20 police officers <coughs> over here, but they're, 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 they're akin to, to those that I've, I've met in the UK too. Um, so, just as when I've met police officers in the UK, I've found them encouraging and invigorating, i found the same so far in my encounters with Australian police officers. However, I certainly don't know enough about them and the specific problems being addressed here to be able to make any kind of sensible comments about them, at least not yet. Uh, work I'm doing currently with colleagues at Griffith uh, will, I think, lead me to get, a, to get more closely acquainted with uh, police officers and the sorts of problems that they're dealing with. But I'm going to stick mainly to examples from England and Wales in what follows. Um, I've had quite extensive experience with police uh, services in the UK for some 30 years. 30 years is the typical length of a, of a police career in the UK, so I've had just about a career's worth of experience of working with them. Uh, they now have to work a bit longer, and they're very cross about it. 
Uh, do you do 30 years or more police officers here? More? Jolly good. Um, <laughs> we'll be importing some of you back into the UK, I think, in your dotage so that you can do something helpful there. Um, anyway, I worked on quite a lot of different kinds of problems with the police. Domestic burglary, commercial burglary, car crime, street robbery, fly tipping, gang-related shootings, crime at motorway service areas and organized crime amongst them. So quite a wide cross-section of some of the sorts of problems that police services have to deal with. And I dare say you have to deal with similar sorts of problems here. Um, more general work has related to Neighbourhood Watch, the development of community safety strategies, closed circuit television, the formation of uh, performance indicators for crime prevention, and the implementation of problem-oriented policing. Rick work, uh, referred to some current work that I'm involved in, uh, most immediately, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm working on the international crime drop and on attempting to catalogue the uh, evaluations that have so far been undertaken, both in relation to crime prevention and in relation to policing. <coughs> <coughs> but before I get to the, to the main uh, thrust of what I want to say, policing, problem solving and crime prevention, I'd like to, 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 to begin by laying out some, some groundwork. There's no doubt that crime can be prevented. All of these sorts of measures have been found, at least in some circumstances, to work. CCTV, improvements in physical security, lighting upgrades, redesign housing and car parks, incapacitation, deterrence, drug treatment, prison education, patrol, police crackdowns, mandatory arrests for domestic violence. They're all tactics that have been used and all tactics which have delivered benefits. But none of them have done so unconditionally. In every case, it would be possible to point to experiences which have either, uh, uh, the use of these tactics which either hasn't had any effect or indeed at worst has had negative effects. The most worrying part about efforts at reducing crime is that they can backfire. Goodwill, good intentions, surface plausibility aren't enough to produce real reductions in crime. Sometimes interventions backfire. Most famously, uh, studies of mandatory arrest for domestic violence have found in some communities that it has led to increased repeat incidents, whilst in others it's led to reductions in them. At worst, at, at, it, it, of course, it's perfectly possible that the same measure can in increase problems for some and reduce problems for other, others and produce an apparent net, 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 net non-effect. So non a finding of no effects doesn't necessarily mean no effects. It means that the effects netted out are, are, are not there, that there may be some effects of in increasing crime and some effects of, of reducing crime. Um, that seems to be the case with uh, uh, mandatory arrest for domestic violence. It seems also to be the case with uh, holiday play schemes, for example. So we need evidence uh, in order better to inform what we do, and more particularly, when and where we do what we do. Third, I want to stress that there is no simple relationship between police numbers and crime. This is a graph which shows police numbers and numbers of, 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 of crimes, uh, domestic burglary and, and personal crime in this case. What we can see is that indexing the numbers to 1996, that the crime began to fall whilst police numbers remained constant. Uh, they, they fell at a slightly lower rate when police numbers were increasing. And since 2009 to 10, police numbers have been decreasing following um, uh, retrenchment measures, austerity measures in the UK, but crime levels have continued to drop. So police numbers don't add up necessarily to any kind of uh, 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 drop in crime. There's no, there's no simple equation, no simple relationship between, uh, there seems to be no simple relationship between numbers of police officers and uh, the amount of crime uh, there is. Um, the... the the, um, that said, of course, it, is, it, is not, it is doesn't mean that, not, that police officers make no difference to crime levels. Um, uh, when there have been police strikes, crime levels have gone up. Not everybody's committed crime, but crime levels have gone up. So it's the marginal change in police numbers doesn't necessarily produce uh, a drop in crime. And marginal decreases in numbers of police officers doesn't seem to uh, immediately have an effect on crime uh, trends. But what the police do certainly does have an effect on crime levels. Um, these are a series of tactics 
are a series of conceptions of policing, um, all of which have in common uh, the fact that they, uh, that they embrace some form of problem solving. Um, I've been uh, most involved in problem-oriented policing and problem-oriented partnership, and I have to say I prefer those terms to describe the kind of policing that I'm going to discuss in more detail uh, as we go on. Um, the idea of problem-oriented policing originated in the United States with a man called Herman Goldstein. It's been widely embraced in the UK, where it's often now referred to as problem-oriented partnership, to recognize the fact that problems, uh, crime problems, and other kinds of problems for which the police are responsible can seldom be dealt with effectively by police services on their own. But hotspots policing, evidence-based policing, smart policing, partnership policing, third-party policing, community policing, intelligence-led policing, and comps don't all mean the same thing. They don't all mean exactly the same as problem-oriented policing, but they do, bear, they do have in common a focus on evidence, a focus on identifying what the problems are, identifying where, when, and who's involved in problems, and targeting efforts to deal with those forms of crime concentration, and also uh, some kind of feedback to ensure that um, the, um, the results of efforts uh, are, 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 are assessed. Um, they all want to be... Uh, so, so, so it's these, these forms of policing which have, I suppose, um, taken hold in the last 20 to 30 years, um, seem to me all to be positive directions for policing and, as I say, to bear, have, have much in, in common. The, the, the fifth uh, background point I, I want to make is that, is that in a given problem can be responded to in all sorts of rather different ways. Um, so if you take car crime, um, we can target enforcement on prolific uh, people, uh, prolific car, car thieves. Um, we can advise drivers to, to lock their cars. We can advise them not to leave their valuables on show. We can warn drivers who park in dangerous locations that they risk having their cars pinched or, or risk having stuff stolen from their cars. We can try and engage with car park proprietors to persuade them to make their car parks more secure. We can engage in a larger scale in schemes that would recognize car parks uh, with a tight mark if they meet minimum security standards. Um, we can design secure car parking into new developments. Um, we can persuade car manufacturers to improve the security of their cars. We can mobilize consumer organizations to highlight weaknesses in the security of some kinds of car. And the government can require minimum security levels. I think in parts of Australia, um, electronic immobilizers are mandatory on new cars across all Australia. It's a kind of example where car crime has been responded to in a, at, a, at a level which has required government intervention. Um, so the same kind of problem is open to all sorts of intervention. Uh, some of these forms of intervention are within the clear remit of the police, but most not. The police can target enforcement on prolific car thieves. They may be able to issue advice to uh, drivers to lock their cars. But as we move up beyond to six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10 uh, as responses to car crime, they require a different level of involvement. They're not on the whole uh, within the, uh, uh, it, 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 they're beyond the, the remit, they're beyond the, the, uh, the capacity of local police officers to exert some kind of influence. Um, and problem solving involves considering the full panoply of responses and those involved in problem solving need not be restricted to those who are involved in local neighborhoods, but might also need to involve mobilizing uh, uh, behavior by uh, those in, 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 in different settings. Um, and I think it's important to realize that the same problem can be addressed in lots of different ways, but that who can play a part in affecting those sorts of responses to crime problems it, it will, will vary. Um, crime problems are, 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 are heavily concentrated um, uh, and, and, and uh, it's the concentration of crime problems that allows us to focus preventive attention. This is a map of, I owe this to a colleague Spencer Cheney, this is a map 
of uh, of vehicle theft in Camden. Camden is a borough in North London. Um, and this shows us the, the, uh, the outline of, 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 of Camden. Um, and the hotspots show locations of vehicle theft. Um, we can see here the time that the offences take place. And we can see that the... What do, what, anyway, you're all bright people. What, what, what makes sense of this, do you think? Could I, let, let's, let's involve, have an order of participation. What, how, would you, how would you understand that what's going on here? Hmm? Yes? The, the offenders are moving around. Okay. And that's, a, that's a nice offender focus. What else, what else might explain this? Okay, more people. Anything else? Yeah, that's a car park. Yeah, that might be it. Um, okay, uh, all of those are quite plausible things. But what, 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 what I should probably say is that the, just along there marks the boundary for uh, um, uh, uh, charge for using. For, for you have to pay if you go into that area. This is, this is a. Uh, this is where you, you now have to pay if you drive in central London. And this is the boundary that marks the point that at which you start having to pay in order to park. These are residential neighbourhoods. And what we see here is that the cars tend to get stolen uh, overnight, but um, uh, not in the daytime. Uh, here's a... Here's, a, 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 again, a, a residential neighbourhood. Here is a kind of interesting area, and this is vehicle theft, and the vehicles that are stolen here in large numbers are motor scooters, and motor, motorbikes and motor scooters, and motorbikes and motor scooters don't have to pay to drive into the local area. Um, so you've got a different kind of time for the stealing cars, and you've got different cars being stolen that reflect the different land uses across this borough. And what can be done in relation to vehicle theft will differ according to these different neighbourhoods because what's being stolen and when it's being stolen and the circumstances it's being stolen are a bit different. And problem solving requires that we identify uh, concentrations of crime and that we orientate our preventive efforts to our uh, detailed understanding of, of, of how crimes are concentrated. So that's the that's concentration by space and time. This is the concentration by victim. Um, I guess the good or bad news, how you like to look at it, about repeat victimisation has got into Australia. It's well known. But this is just from the British Crime Survey. And it's still every time I look at it, it still strikes me that the chances of somebody suffering vandalism on, uh, on one occasion is less than 10%, but once you've suffered vandalism on one occasion, then your, in your chances of being vandalised again within a 12-month period go up to close to 30%, and if you suffer vandalism twice, your chances of being vandalised a, a third time go up to something like 45%. The steps in terms of increased risks, depending on the number of times of previous victimisation, is pretty consistent across crime types. And all this suggests that a consistent approach to preventing crime involves uh, attempting to reduce the vulnerability of those who've already been victimised. Um, we can see that what gets stolen, there are patterns in what gets stolen. This is, uh, 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 Rick, Rick himself has done some great work on stuff being stolen in the past with some astonishing uh, findings. I think it was, was it horse trailers get stolen at, a, at an astonishing rate? The rate of theft of horse of, of horse boxes was just unbelievably high. Um, not very many of them, but they're stolen at very high... I haven't got the slide for that, but it struck me as being a fantastic counterintuitive finding. What gets stolen most often? Horse boxes. Who'd believe it? And, and it, it, it's one of the reasons for looking carefully at, at data. Um, this is less surprising. What it shows is that... Well, I, 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 what it shows is that lightweight things that are easy to pinch get stolen in large numbers. So if you look at the relationship between weight, value, and uh, basically portability and, and value and desirability, 
those sorts of things tend to get pinched. And when televisions became uh, very heavy, they weren't stolen in very large numbers. Now that they're lightweight, I think they're probably stolen a bit more. But now that they're so cheap that anybody can afford them, once they become so cheap that anybody can afford them, they stop being stolen. So what gets pinched changes over time, but they have similar kinds of attributes. If they're light, they're high value, they're desirable, they're, they're, they're saleable, they tend to get, they tend to get pinched. Um, and so we might want to focus our attention on making things that are typically easily stolen less stealable. One of the reasons why I think you made immobilizers mandatory here is because cars are stolen, in, well, have been stolen in very large numbers. Um, um, so you, um, who, who commits crime uh, 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 varies. This is the most famous finding in criminology, which you'll all be familiar with, the, 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 the age crime curve. Kids commit crime most often, and by the time you get to my age, if you're still alive, you don't do it very much. Um, I certainly did quite a lot of it at this age. Uh, as I dare say, uh, most of the other men here did too, although I'm not embarrassed at you by asking you. Um, uh, even in the late 1940s, when one of the early self-report studies was done, oh, something over 90% of folk admitted to committing uh, offences in their, in their youth. Um, what's I'm not going to talk about it now, but what's slightly interesting is that there's been a change in the age crime curve um, uh, uh, over the past decade in Britain, uh, so the peak has dropped a lot. Um, I, 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 it's nothing to do with this talk, but I can talk in private about that if any of you are interested. But we do find that young people are mostly the, the, the most often involved in offending. Offending is concentrated on a relatively small number of people. This is a rather complicated um, chart, but basically it tells us that, um, that uh, 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 even though offending might be widespread, even though most of us, at least most of the males amongst us, will commit crime, will have admitted crime periodically, um, uh, nevertheless, there are a relatively small number of prolific offenders who are accountable for quite a large volume of crime. So crime is concentrated by place, it's concentrated by target, it's concentrated by victim, it's concentrated by offender, and those forms of concentration give us the basis for targeting our preventive efforts. Um, this is a, this is a, a, a slide which, which, which really says much the same. I, I, I'm showing only because I, 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 I did the work on this, and what it shows is that snatch theft uh, has quite distinct patterns in terms of time of day, and also in terms of, of gender and, and age. Um, um, offenders might like to pretend that they're uh, sometimes that they're, they're, they're chivalrous, but uh, old ladies have their bags stolen at a remarkably high rate, um, 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 uh, which I tell my wife. Uh, uh, but it's a bit different for men. So this is a way of trying to show concentrations of snatch theft by victim, age, um, by uh, uh, gender, uh, and by time of the, of the day. And, and there are some quite distinct patterns which would suggest how and where we might target our preventive efforts. It's this kind of careful identification of the problem which lies at the heart of problem solving. So SARA describes the process that's widely used now. And are, are you all using the SARA model? Well, you have this, this pattern of scanning, which is basically what I've described so far, which is a really rather detailed outline of where and what the nature of the problem is. Analysis, which is not about understanding everything there is to know about a problem, is about trying to understand those parts of the causal process which are open to intervention. We don't, if we can't do anything about in the short term, and I, I get into trouble for saying this, we can't do anything about patriarchy in the short term. Um, we probably can't do anything about class inequality in the short term. We might not be able to do anything about ethnic relations in the short term. Um, and all of those things are causally rather important in generating patterns of crime. But what we're concerned with, what, what problem-oriented policing is concerned with, problem-solving policing is, is to find some part of the causal process which is open to relatively immediate interventions. Um, Richard came out with a great example yesterday, and I can't resist using it. If you're driving to a bend in the road and there's a cliff in front of you, do you want to wait till you've taught us all to become responsible drivers, or do you want to put a barrier up straight away to stop people driving over the edge, or a sign telling them they're imminently going to come to a, 
point where they might go across the road and they should be prepared to turn to avoid the, uh, to avoid the precipice. Even though part of the cause might be irresponsible young drivers, what problem-oriented policing is concerned with is trying to find some point of intervention which is relatively immediately open to, 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 to change. And in, in, in the case of people, if you do drive over cliffs repeatedly, heaven forbid, putting a barrier in the way to stop them driving over is, is just what the problem-oriented policing people would do rather than waiting till we'd all become uh, responsible uh, drivers. So we analyze for the points of potential intervention. The response describes what's done in order to address the problem. What, could, what can we do realistically? What can we do ethically? Ethically is, is important, is realistically. Chopping hands off doesn't sound to me a very good. Uh, it, it might be very effective in preventing repeat shock theft, but for all sorts of obvious reasons, we wouldn't want to do it. Um, so we're concerned with the ethics of, 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 of responses uh, too. And in relation to, to what we said yesterday, some degree of proportionality in relation to risk. So um, uh, the ethics is important as well. And then we want to find out whether or not what we've done has been effective. So the SARA process uh, is re-described in a whole host of different sorts of ways, uh, all of which amount to basically the same thing. Indeed, the public health models that we heard about yesterday are not entirely different in terms of the sorts of, uh, of, of approaches that they're describing as well. Although sometimes there's a, there's, 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 there's a, a, a lower um, concern about effecting, I think, immediate changes, uh, which is not to say that what's being done is not sensible. Indeed, it's very sensible, very appropriate, but problem-oriented policing is, 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 is concerned with producing um, short as well as long-term uh, effects. Um, the problem analysis triangle, again, is frequently used. Are you all familiar with the problem analysis triangle? Maybe not. The problem analysis triangle is, is closely associated with, um, with, with uh, something called routine activities theory. Routine activities theory is ever so straightforward, but deeply profound. Routine activity theory says that for, and this is how it was originally formulated, for a direct contact predatory crime, three things have to coincide in space and time. There has to be somebody who wants to commit a crime, there has to be a suitable target for the crime, and there has to be nobody to get in the way between the one and the other. The person getting in the way between the one and the other was originally called a capable guardian. The term intimate handle is also now sometimes used to describe people who can deter the offender rather than to protect the target. Um, the problem analysis, and, and, and what, according to the routine activities, the... The, 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 the amount and distribution of crime is a function of the supply distribution and movement of these three phenomena. Um, I've, I've said that rather formally. I can explain it in more detail to anybody who's really interested. But all it says is that there are these three key features that need to meet together for a crime to take place. The distribution of circumstances in which they do meet with one another is a function, as I say, of the number, volume, uh, change in the supply of suitable targets and, and likely offenders, and also the supply distribution and movement of those who can intercede between the two. And, and, and it, it, it sounds desperately simple, and, and, and um, uh, Marcus Colson, who's uh, really been the chief developer and proponent of the theory, has been castigated for the simplicity of the theory, but it's hugely powerful. And it lies behind this problem analysis triangle. And what this tells us, in effect, is that if we can remove any one of the crucial ingredients for crime, the crime can't take place. So if we, um, uh, uh, and, and, and this is, this is, a, this is a, 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 I owe this to a, a man called John Eck, um, um, who, who originally developed the problem analysis, no, he didn't actually develop the problem analysis triangle, but he certainly uh, um, produced this, uh, this um, uh, 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 refinement of it. And what it says is that we can do things in relation to each of these three key features of crime to, uh, to, um, to, to, to reduce the problem. So sometimes we want to concentrate, we, and we, we pick opportunistically. What, can we introduce handlers who can um, deter offenders? Can we introduce uh, managers uh, to make places safer? Can we introduce guardians to protect targets? Uh, can we do something in order to change the design of space so that these three uh, crucial ingredients don't come together. Um, so uh, all, all of this has been, has, has been um, I, I, I've, I've got the slide slightly in the wrong order. 
this kind of general approach to reducing crime, um, adopting the SARA process, using the problem analysis triangle, figuring out points of intervention in order to try and address specific problems, has been used very widely on a whole, whole range of different sorts of problems. I've listed some of them here. Vandalism at an Oakham tourist attraction. Uh, the police there had traditionally tried to solve this recurrent problem by hiding inside the tourist attraction, watching out for kids throwing stones, and then running and arresting them. Very much a standard police response. The solution to the problem turned out to be to remove the loose gravel beyond the shying distance of the local people. Ever so simple, but actually not done. So this problem had gone on for years and years and years, and the desperately simple solution, remove the ammo, uh, took, 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 a long took a long time to develop. Car crime at a Leicester supermarket. This was, a, again, a problem in, in, in the close to the centre of, of, of Leicester, where um, cars were being stolen, and, and there were theft from cars before most of the cars had immobilisers fitted to them. And the police response there had been to, it's good for overtime, the police there had lain on top of the roof of the supermarket with binoculars, and they'd had two-way radios with other officers covertly standing in the car park to try and spot people breaking into cars, so then they'd phone down and say, this car's being pinched, can you go and arrest the person? Quite expensive, not very effective. And in the end, what they did there, which is now very widely done, was to put um, people who collected the trolleys in, um, in brightly coloured jackets with security written on the back, and they went and collected these trolleys in a rather conspicuous way at the times at which the cars were being most often stolen. Again, quite effective, rather obvious, but not what was traditionally done. It required something of a change in mindset to adopt a, a, a different a, 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 a approach. Theft of outboard motors on the, in the Norfolk Marina simply in, involved the police in conjunction with a local manufacturer producing a rather brightly coloured cowling for the radio, which said, uh, which in effect property marked it, um, fixing that uh, and, 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 and making the, 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 um, the uh, outboard motors then very difficult to steal. Huge effect. Robbery. So these are all, the, I mean, the last thing in Liverpool, let, let me, I'll just say a little bit about that, um, partly because it, it, it relates to this, something of, 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 of what Karen said yesterday about, about um, Glasgow. Glasgow uh, looked horrendous. It looked, I mean, I, I was a bit surprised to find a UK city that was quite so, 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 so bad as that. Liverpool has a reputation of being a, a difficult city. Uh, glassing is a problem there, but glassing there is generally done with a bottle. Um, so the shape of the bottle, you break the bottle and you stick it in somebody's face. It produces horrendous injuries. Um, in, in, in they, they had what they call, the, the problem solving in Liverpool often involved what they called Operation Crystal, which simply prohibited um, bars and off-licenses from selling um, uh, beer in glass bottles, or indeed from using glass to uh, serve uh, beer at, at, at night. Um, so the levels of glassing went down immediately. Um, you didn't do anything about the motivation of people to fight one another. Difficult in Liverpool. Um, but nevertheless, the wherewithal to cause these horrendous injuries were, were, was, was removed with a, with a, with a substantial and, and, and short-term impact. So, uh, vacation, I, 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 I like all these projects, and I love hearing police officers talk about them because they involve often rather simple interventions, but ones that seem stupid once you hear about them, but whose imaginativeness comes out from the fact that they weren't used for years and years and years, and rather traditional approaches were used which were rather expensive and ineffective. So, the, 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 the charm for me of problem solving is the is the, is, 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 is the quick impact and, 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 and the lateral thought that, 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 go, that goes into them. Um, often infor informed initially by the close specification of the problem and some kind of analysis to try and find what we sometimes refer to as the pinch points. Where, where in the causal chain is there a pinch point? Where can we 
where can we really make some kind of, 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 of effect? Um, and in effect, like today or tomorrow, not, not necessarily down. And the range of problems is, 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 is bewildering. And it, they reflect the kind of range of problems that exist in local communities, not all the same in, not the same in all communities, but which are spread across communities, some of which are very serious, some of which are fatal. Motorcycle deaths in Lancashire, these were born again bikers riding their motorcycles rather quickly during the, on the, over the windy roads in, in the north of England, killing themselves and other people in some numbers. Um, and a clever project there involving, in this case, lots of different sorts of interventions to make motorcycling safer and reducing the number of deaths on the road as a result. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge enthusiast, uh, not because these are grand projects, but often because they're small but nevertheless effective in tackling uh, real, real, local, real local problems. Um, so what have I said so far? Lots of ways of preventing crime. Lots of the ways are not directly controlled by the police. These sorts of measures here were, were often not under... The, just take the examples there. The police didn't have the powers to remove the rubble near to Oakham Castle. They had to persuade the local parks department to, 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 remove, the, to remove the gravel. Um, they couldn't patrol the car park. They had to persuade the local supermarket that they should adopt a different method of collecting their trolleys. Um, um, in the case of outboard motors, they had to work with a local manufacturer, a local manufacturer of cowlings to produce this, this different kind of cowling and so on. So uh, in, in, in glassing, they had to work with the licensing authorities to alter the terms under which people could sell alcohol there. So in all cases, in none of these cases were the police able to do these, to, to, in, to intervene directly. They had in all cases to, to persuade third parties. Um, the measures that the, the crime prevention measures tend not to work unconditionally. We get frustrating mixed research findings. Sometimes we try and net them to say what on balance does it look like if we look across lots of different evaluations. Um, but what's important for me is to understand sufficiently well the local setting that we can work out whether the kinds of measures we're putting in place are going to be relevant to that particular problem and then to implement it properly. Um, I've given lots of examples. And, uh, but I, I do want to say routinizing, um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, routinizing um, problem solving is very difficult. And these are, these are four kinds of hassles that have got in the way of making, even though it seems so blinking obvious, and even though it's so effective, and you don't even find so much enthusiasm for it, even though there's so much energy when people get involved in it, it still nevertheless comes and goes, it fades, it's done in a half-hearted, ineffective way. And these are some of the key problems. Data. I've talked about trying to get a good picture of the problem. Horrendously difficult. Data is problematic for partly because it's often poor, poorly kept, reporting, reports aren't always made. People don't share data. Karen gave a terrific example of people sharing data yesterday. She's done a fabulous job in, a, in achieving that in Glasgow, but it continues to be horrendously difficult, in particular to get health services and police services and social services to share data. And yet to get an overall decent, accurate picture of the nature of problems in local communities requires good data that's freely made available. Police officers will sometimes say, we're too busy, we don't have time to do this sort of stuff, it's an indulgence. Well, it's not really true. I, mean, I won't go through the sums, but there's a kind of illusion of busyness, um, um, which I, 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 I don't mind really upsetting people. I'm, I'm in a foreign country. Um, <laughs> I've spent quite a lot of time patrolling with police officers whose general response to me is, you should have been here last Thursday, Nick. We were really busy. And that's typical. This is unusual. This is quiet. Something must have happened. Um, and it's an illusion. People remember the busy times and they don't remember the times when they're not so busy. And I just don't buy into this no time. And sometimes there's a problem of ability. I talk about enormously competent and impressive and inspiring police officers but there are some dodos too. Um, the incentives can be a bit poor. Um, police officers in Britain, and particularly the young ones, you get them when they're a bit older, but the young ones in Britain, really, uh, they're fired with testosterone. Uh, they want to chase people and arrest them. They want to collar people. The result, and television programs partly contribute to this, the real result is arresting somebody. Stopping stuff is a bit boring. Um, 
Uh, I think probably the same is true in health. Uh, doing fancy operations is sexy. Health promotion is much less so. Uh, and the performance indicators that have dogged police services in Britain have sometimes directed people away from doing the sorts of problem solving that they might do. I recall going to a meeting on one occasion with a police officer I liked enormously um, who went to this village meeting. The one thing that bothered people in this village was traffic. Traffic wasn't a performance indicator, so he spent his whole time telling them that they didn't need to concentrate on traffic, yet traffic was the big deal for them. The performance indicator was driving the priorities, not the not the concerns of the local community. <coughs> There's something called the fundamental attribution error. Do you, do you all know what the fundamental attribution error is? Well, some of you, I know we've got a bunch of psychologists here, you all know what it is. What, what this is in a nutshell is that we, I, I committed crime when I was a youngster because I was bored. I didn't do it because I was bad. I did it because everybody else was doing it. Um, 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 and, 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 and uh, you know, I <laughs> when we look at our own behaviour, we tend to attribute it to external circumstances, to conditions. When we look at other people's behaviour, we tend to attribute it to their badness. Um, so the fundamental attribution error is attributing too much importance to internal urges to behave one way or another at the expense of understanding that circumstances are often quite important. And what we need to do often in problem solving is to change the external circumstances that affect people when they behave uh, and, and acknowledge the fact that that's a key causal factor. The, the fundamental attribution error is very difficult to get rid of. It's very difficult not to think of, of, a f of what makes offenders offend, what, why are they so bad, what's wrong with their brains. Um, when we behave ourselves in aberrant ways, we don't tend to refer to those explanations. We tend to refer to the circumstances that we're in. And the circumstances that we're in are much more powerful in affecting our behaviour than is sometimes acknowledged. And then there's the issue of responsibility and competence. I've touched on that already. The police are often held responsible for crime. The criminal justice system is often held responsible for controlling crime, yet they're not the most competent body. By which I mean to say they're not incompetent in doing what they can do, but they don't have the powers to affect the circumstances which create conditions for crime. They can't redesign cars, for example. The major source of the crime got which... Rick knows about just as well as I do, has really been the improvement in the security of cars. It's led to a massive drop in the crime levels. It's not within the powers of the police to change that. The competence to do that lies with the car manufacturers, not with the police. The police can go about arresting people, so that tends to be what they do. The police can go around arresting people who throw stones in Oakham, beauty, you know, tourist attractions in Oakham. They, they, they have the competence to do that, um, but they don't have the competence to remove the rubble. And that mismatch between responsibility and competence is, 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 is I think, a big problem. And then leadership, which Karen talked about yesterday, is also uh, hugely important. Um, uh, it's as if... I, I'm, uh, have we got very senior police officers here? Commissioner-type police officers here? Good. Um, uh, <laughs> I was going to say something slightly rude about them. It's as if when they become senior enough, common sense goes out the window. Um, and so, you know, I've been to one or two uh, police services which have said, we like this problem-solving stuff, and so they've instructed a sergeant to implement it the next Monday. It's just beggar's belief, and they say, I've issued a force order. You will do problem-solving. <sighs> it just doesn't work like that. It's more difficult to get things done than that might seem to be the case. So implementation, uh, you know, in spite of 30-odd years of this kind of problem solving is the first, the first time partnership in Britain was recommended, and in a sense, problem solving as part of it was in Home Office Circular 8 of 84. It's now 30 years since that was first being pushed. And yet, some of the sorts of things that you would expect for that still don't happen. These sorts of implementation hurdles persist. Um, but there are, and, and I don't want to finish there. I, for all that, I remain optimistic. I remain optimistic because of the quality and imaginativeness of lots of the people I've been lucky enough to work with. But also, I recently, I, recently I, 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 I want to talk a little bit about a police service in, in the north of England. Uh, it's Durham. I, I, I've, I've, ca I've carefully not said the name here, but it's Durham Police Service, uh, which is in the north of England. And the chief constable there... Uh, 
said to me when I went over to see him not long ago, I want to be the best police service on the planet. He's not a man of low ambition, of low vision. <laughs> he didn't want to beat Britain. He wanted to beat Australia, the United States, Chile, France. Uh, and, he, and, he, and he meant it. And he, and he tells his police service that that's what he wants to do. Uh, and he makes problem solving the cornerstone of, it, of his efforts to make his police service the best on the planet. It's a small police service by British standards, roughly 3,000 staff. So I think by the standards of Australia, it would be much smaller than even your smallest police service. Uh, but what he can do at that size of police service is interview every single incoming member of staff. And he interviews every single incoming member of staff to assess their competence and commitment to doing problem solving. Mm? Ten minutes, okay. Um, he, he also uses their competence in problem solving as the, as the criterion for their, for their promotion. He's, ex he's contracted some external training and external advice, which is one of the reasons, I've known him for a long time, but one of the reasons why I've had things to do with him recently. He's tried to do problem solving both at the local beat level and across the force as a whole. He's not restricted it to beat officers within local neighborhoods. He's seen it as something which washes through the whole organization. He has a problem solving conference every year where he gets as many officers as he can afford not to be on the streets to come and talk about the problem solving work that they've been doing and he awards prizes for the best forms of problem solving that are being undertaken. It's for one occasion I worked with. He's uh, 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 had the same sorts of difficulties that exist in any kind of organization in persuading third party groups to per take a part. It becomes increasingly difficult the more uh, as, 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 as retrenchment occurs, as austerity measures are applied, and I rather think you might be coming up to that quite soon, if I've understood your budget correctly. Uh, public service organizations are going to be funded less generously and they'll draw their horns in and they want to work with other people. That's, uh, so um, this guy's worked very hard at trying to persuade them that in the end they'll do better to cooperate in terms of resource allocation in not doing so. He's quite good at coaching staff. I, I, as I say, I've known this, 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 this guy for at least 20 years. Um, and going round with him, every police officer he talks to, says, what are you doing? What have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? There's that kind of prodding, coaching, encouragement, which washes through his encounters with, 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 with all the officers he, he, he has to deal with, and he knows the problems that they're operating with. And he's a great risk taker. He, I, I, Karen, Karen, I thought, talked brilliantly yesterday about risk taker. Uh, this guy's a huge risk taker. He's gone on, on record in, in Britain, which is, I have to say, it's a risky thing to do in suggesting that uh, low-level drugs be decriminalized because they cause more crime problems than they solve. Quite a brave thing to do for a, for a, for a senior police officer in a British... He might be wrong. Of course he might be wrong. But at least he has the courage to say uh, what he thinks ought to be done. So, so I think this is a police service that are, is going in at great, great, great guns. Um, and I, if I've got just, I, I, I ought to stop. I just mention one brief example of a, of a large scale piece of problem solving he's doing. There's a problem in Durham of high crime, high organized crime families operating in ex mining villages. The public lost confidence in the police in 1984 to 5 when there was a miners' strike, and the then Prime Minister dragooned the police into basically suppressing it. They hate the police there, and in circumstances where they hate the police, organized crime has flourished. Uh, and so what they've done there is to unpick in some detail how these organized crime families operate. They've worked out the relationships between them, they've worked out the range of criminal activity in which they're involved, and they've assiduously exploited the fact that these are habitual across the board from uh, offenders, and they've told them, they said, we are going to persecute you until you stop. So they check their mortgage applications to see whether there have been any inaccuracies. They check that they're not illicitly uh, applying for social services. They check their insurance uh, applications to make sure there have been no falsifications in their insurance applications. They are on them like a rash, uh, and they say to them, we're on you like a rash until and unless you stop committing crime. The local community who've been enthralled to these folk for a long time, can't bear it, 
kind of, uh, but have been reluctant to, uh, 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 in, uh, to engage the police because of these historical forms of mistrust. Um, but they've managed to persuade, and this is where the beat officers have been involved, they've managed to persuade the police to let them have information about these organized crime uh, families, and they gradually began to dismantle them, and in dismantling them, they've, in they've increased the community's confidence, both to work more uh, cooperatively with the police and to engage in some kind of informal social control. They've changed the balance of power between the organized crime families and the community. Now, I think this is quite ambitious uh, and quite uh, interesting uh, uh, problem solving. Uh, and it's all being done, uh, people are critical sometimes of the police for these kinds of uh, concerted enforcement attention. And the folk in involved have been, have been, um, have protested. The police response has been to write to them and say, I will continue to do this until you, until you stop. It's been absolutely overt. And it's a kind of nice example of a police-led piece of problem solving taking on an intractable problem that had gone on for a long time, which the police had put in the two tricky trays. And, and here was a great effort, in my mind, to develop a coherent strategy that was organized around trying to um, serve the community, to bring the community's capacities uh, back to scratch, but by adopting a rather sophisticated set of enforcement behaviours. Anyway, I think that's enough from me. I'll leave you with these, were my, which were my conclusions, which I probably haven't got time to spell out now, but they should have been, um, they should have been, I think, obvious from what I've been saying so far. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>